Community Improvement Districts, or CIDs, are voluntary taxing districts used across Georgia to stimulate economic growth. Commercial property owners can collectively decide to impose an additional property tax on themselves for transportation infrastructure, landscaping, and district beautification, and public safety initiatives above and beyond those funded by city, county, and state governments. While CIDs must work collectively with city and county governments where their territories overlap, particularly in issues of infrastructure and long-term physical planning, a CID is typically governed by a separate administrative body or board of directors. Cobb County became home to the state's first CID in 1988 when the Cumberland CID was created and continues to make investments and improvements in the areas around Cumberland Mall, the Cobb Galleria Center, and the Battery. Close to the KSU campus in Kennesaw, the Town Center Community Improvement District has made improvements that affect students, faculty, staff, and visitors to campus on a daily basis. Projects like the Skip Span Bridge, Crossing Interstate 75, the Noonday Creek Trail, the Big Shanty Connector, and the Town Center Mall Visioning Study have all become a reality because of the CID. Near the Marietta campus, the Gateway Marietta Community Improvement District has embarked on landscaping and beautification efforts along the Franklin Gateway and South Marietta Parkway corridors, installation of flock security cameras along Franklin Gateway, and a new branded wayfinding signage program. Today, there are over two dozen CIDs throughout Georgia, generally concentrated in the metro Atlanta region. Each of these CIDs reflect the needs and desires of their respective areas and has proven to be a long-term tool for property owners to make direct investment in building more robust and vibrant communities around Georgia. Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to 2023's first Campus to Community Forum sponsored by Kennesaw State University and done by Kennesaw State University. <laughs> My name is Dana Johnson. I'm the Chief Operating Officer of the Cobb Chamber. I'm also the Executive Director of Select Cobb. We are the Economic Development Organization for Cobb County, where we try to recruit and retain businesses and talent here in our community, working with international efforts, workforce efforts, and our economic development partners across the uh, county, region, and state. Uh, these forums are brought to us by KSU, uh, and th their industry leaders on the ground practitioners here to discuss how the research and the teaching that is taking place here at Kennesaw State impacts and relates to the key industries and economies of Cobb County, the Atlanta region, Northwest Georgia, and the entire state. As you heard in the introductory video, community improvement districts have proven to be a valuable tool for long-term investments in order to help major commercial districts in the state invest in transportation solutions, quality of life, public safety, and other types of improvements that make them great places to live, work, and recreate. Our CIDs make positive impacts in our communities across the entire state. Today, we are delighted to have three amazing professionals. Ms. Tracy Steiff, the Executive Director of the Town Center Community Improvement District. Mr. Bob Voyles, he is the Principal and Founder of Seven Oaks Real Estate. He is also a Board Member of both the Cumberland and the Perimeter Community Improvement Districts. And Dr. Tyler Reinagle, he is the Associate Vice President for Economic Development and is the Radau College of Humanities and Social Sciences uh, as a professor in public administration here at Kennesaw State University. These forums are intended to be discussions. We're here to invite you to take part in this conversation. Please pose your questions for the panel in the live stream chat function. Uh, we will cover as many of your questions as possible. Today's forum will be framed um, as a discussion, 
so none of our planets are able to do their jobs in isolation or without the support and contributions of others. So I pose today's first question. I encourage them to rely on one another, to connect the dots, and to really create a conversation amongst uh, the three of you. So the first one I'm going to ask for all three of you to chime in on, and I'm going to start with you, Mr. Voiles. Uh, CIDs are somewhat of a unique asset to the communities that they serve and the value that and benefits they provide for an area are often not fully appreciated. From your different perspectives on the panel, can you please give me your elevator speech on what a CID is and kind of somehow what, what the concept is of what you do as, as, as an organization? I sure. have this question first. <laughs> uh, well, I have uh, had the pleasure of serving on two CID boards uh, and was a founding member of the Perimeter CID board. Um, I'm a strong believer in them. I'm a business owner and a real estate developer. Um, the advantage that CIDs offer communities is that it's essentially a self-taxing district where um, the authority or the, the, C the community improvement district is actually authorized by the local jurisdiction to create this district and they tax the businesses voluntarily tax themselves and that money instead of going into the um, county or the city coffers it is reserved and held and managed by the property owners that make up the CID and what's important about that is that those dollars then are a way for uh, to handle expenses or to do uh, initial work, design work, and other things that uh, an individual property owner could not do on themselves. So it's essentially, if you think about it like a western town where everybody checks their guns at the door, because a lot of these people <laughs> compete with each other. We do on a regular basis, but we check our guns at the door and we come together and sit down and say, what can we do? What's it's what's best for our community. Great. Tracy? I think I use a little bit um, softer of a euphemism. I, I say to the CID board, if you are coming in wearing your CID board member hat when you're making strategic decisions for the organization, you are also wearing the hat of the commercial property owner because the CIDs work to do what's in an, our initially best interest for our primary stakeholder, which is the commercial property owner. But what that does is it benefits the entire community, right. as you can see throughout. So residents do not pay, and visitors do not pay this additional tax. Only the commercial property owners do, but it benefits everyone. So I see our role as convener and facilitator. We oftentimes stand in the gap with projects where we're looking at how we can take something from just an idea and a vision to implementation and execution. And those things take a long, long time. I'd, I'd say the, the biggest thing that CIDs are able to do is bring communities to the next level. You know, Tracy um, has a video from the, the 1980s, I believe, of Barrett Parkway when Town Center Mall was under construction. The Town Center area is not new by any stretch of the imagination, but the work that what Town Center CID, among the other two dozen or so in Georgia, the work that they're doing is taking it to the next level. How do we take this community that we have and push it further? How do we take it to the next level in terms of transportation planning, in terms of places to recreate, um, bringing in new parks and new beautification efforts? So it's, it really is about taking the community to the next level. Thank you all. Um, you know, probably one of the most glaring questions that came out of the introductory video is why would an entity decide to tax itself more? And, uh, you know, you are already paying your city, your local, your school board, uh, and your state taxes. Um, as a executive director, a board member, and a researcher, you know, what are some of the reasons why that you see businesses deciding this is a good thing for their best interest? Tracy, can I start with you on yeah, this one? Yeah, sure. I think you know, Bob said it already, and just to, to say it again, is that commercial property owners understand the value of that investment. They understand that it is going to not only retain and improve the property values of the assets that they hold, but it's going to make a broader impact in the community from an economic development standpoint. Your community improvement districts in Georgia over the past 35 years have been in these commercial areas that have seen a lot of evolution and change. And 
with that has come the need for other entities to get involved, but the CIDs have really been the primary driver in those communities doing the visioning and master planning, then partnering with people at the local, state, and federal level to accomplish projects. Great. Bob? Yeah, I'd come at it a slightly different way. Um, and, and the reason for that is, is that elected officials, no matter whether you're at the state or the county or the, um, or the city level, respond to voters. And business owners are not always voters. A lot of the business owners live outside of the political jurisdiction. Some do, some don't. But so what happens is, is that when the city is trying to decide to allocate scarce resources in their budgets, they tend to listen to the homeowners and the folks who are voting over businesses. And so what we saw at Cumberland and we saw this at Perimeter, which are two of the largest employment districts in the state, um, is that our needs, our traffic needs, and these both of them were really created initially to address the lack of local connectivity within those markets. And as they've gotten better, they've now done a lot of other things, but the issue was we, weren't, we didn't have a voice at the table. But once, the, when the elected officials said, well, if you want to tax yourself and use those dollars, that's okay with us. <laughs> and so that's how the CIDs ultimately got, got the, uh, what I would call the rocket fuel that kind of helped spring them forward. I echo both sentiment there. It, it, it's really that operative word of investment. Uh, it is an out-of-pocket expense now and this year, yes, absolutely. But what you get as a result of that is driving up your property value. It's driving up, if you're a business, the foot traffic that you're getting, the retail sales. It's really just a, a short-term cost for a long-term benefit. Uh, and the investment that, that business owners are willing to make in that region speaks volumes to how much they want this to succeed. So I think just looking at it as investment, 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 that's what it's all about. Well, and at Town Center, we can take one of a property owner's dollar and turn it into 12 on average on an infrastructure project. So that is a pretty significant return on investment really for any type of project that you're looking at. And for us, the infrastructure piece of getting people to point A to point B, not only to their businesses, but through the community to where else they're going to go in Metro Atlanta is the cornerstone of what we do 25 years yeah, later. Tracy, I love that you brought that up and I'd love you and Bob to talk a little bit about how how do you take that one dollar and turn it into twelve dollars? That's a really great point. I think it's very interesting on how you leverage money. Well, I'll let Tracy go first on this. One. <laughs> <laughs> we um, prime those. So those dollars come in, and and for town center specifically, we do not have a city inside of our boundary line. We are in fully unincorporated Cobb County, so we don't have a city tax on top. It, in Perimeter and North Fulton and some other CIDs around Metro Atlanta you do have cities inside CID boundary lines. But for us, those dollars come through the property tax and then we collect it. And then we take that and we do things at the beginning. Right. We do concept design, master planning, preliminary engineering, and then right of way um, to help forward projects. And so then we work with the county at the local level for SPLOST funding or other DOT budget funding or parks and rec funding in order to execute on projects. And then we partner with the state and federal partners at DOT and others to complete projects. So it's, it's really a concentric circle um, philosophy of investment that the CID and the commercial property owners are putting their dollars in first and saying, look, we've got skin in this game, which then allows us to go to these entities and say, we have a plan, we have partnership, and we need you to partner with us. And so it's an attractive model because we're able to bring that money in at the beginning in order to leverage it into even more. So really it's a commercial property owner showing the leadership and vision, investing in an idea, mm -hmm. and then leveraging the state and federal dollars in order to see it come to fruition. Absolutely. Yeah, and maybe another way to look at it is before these CIDs were put in place is that the local development community might go to uh, the applicable political jurisdiction and ask for something and then so they they go back to their budget process and their local highway folks the C, in this that case Cobb DOT 
So we don't have the money to do that this year. We'll look at it in three or four years. And you know, if you're running a business and you have certain issues, whether it's traffic, it could be a whole host of things, you can't wait three or four years. You might not be in business. And so what, what as, as Tracy was saying, it's real important to see that the CIDs are basically provide seed money, seed capital to do things like planning, working with the city, um, working, we're always, we partner with our political jurisdictions, but we do a lot of the initial work that then moves us to the front of the line with Georgia DOT when they're spending their money. They know that we've already got our act together, and so our projects, instead of sitting down here, are moved up closer to the top. Yeah. And we also get to partner with our commercial property owners to be a voice for them when they have needs or issues that arise. And I was just dealing with an issue today that we received um, notification from some community leaders that there was, there was a problem in our district and they didn't know who the property owner was. Well, I knew who the property owner was, had a relationship with them, was able to send an email and five minutes later there was a response that said, we'll have that taken care of this afternoon. So it's those types of relationships, the relationships that you, you need before you need them that help us um, you know, improve the area in a variety of ways. That's great, that's great. So Bob, um, you serve on the Cumberland Community Improvement District Board of Directors. That was the first CID in the state of Georgia in 1998, right. although you were not on the board at its original inception. You've been with the group for a long time now. Um, what do you think are some of those early stage lessons that you learned from Cumberland that you think are applicable across the CIDs across the state? Well, two things. One is Cumberland was really specifically set up to address the lack of adequate infrastructure within the market. I was a, I was a tenant um, in the Galleria project in the early 1980s, and if you wanted to go to the northwest um, side of the market on, on the opposite side of, of uh, the inter intersection of 285 and 75, it took you 15 minutes to drive all the way around. There was no direct connection. There was no circular connection, and um, and it it was there were uh, that was just the beginning of problems. And so what the Cumberland CID did, the first thing they did was build the Kennedy Interchange. They built Cumberland Boulevard. They didn't. They built it with the county and with the state. But once that traffic infrastructure started improving, all of the property owners benefited from that. Ultimately, it, and it spurred um, retail development, multifamily came in, and you know now the Cumberland CID is a very, I think we have 30, I don't wanna say 30,000, but it, that's pretty getting pretty close to it. We have a lot of full-time residents in the Cumberland CID where uh, before it was just a drive-through um, community. The same thing's happening at Perimeter, but Cumberland's really led the way. Yeah, and it's funny because if you think about it, the early investments that the Cumberland Community Improvement District did really set the stage for a major development. And you didn't know what the major development was going to be, <laughs> but you knew that you needed the infrastructure in order to accommodate right. something that's going to be a large scale. And I don't think the forefathers of the Cumberland CID could have ever expected the Atlanta Braves to build a, a stadium and a, a mini city adjacent <laughs> to it uh, right in the heart of Cumberland. But it was because of that foresight uh, that those early leaders in Cumberland had that really set the stage for some pretty amazing economic success for, for a region. I think that's correct. I mean, they were, you know, you had great foresight um, in the Cobb County leadership going back to Earl Smith and uh, Mr. Pilcher before him. There was a whole host of folks. I mean, a simple thing like for the 30339 area code, they kept an Atlanta address for businesses who were coming to town who, you know, there's no, I love Smyrna, okay? <laughs> Derek Norton's a good friend. Um, Max is a, also a good friend. All the, these are mayors of Smyrna. Um, but the reality is, is that if you're an international business like Home Depot yeah. and you tell people, where's your headquarters? Well, it's in Smyrna, Georgia, that, you know, that you're, we all are from Atlanta. Yeah. I mean, ultimately the region. 
but that's the kind of leadership, but also the fact that they stepped in and kind of once our CID got started, it was a true partnership. And it's a, it, that's why Perimeter, actually we came over and visited with John Williams and the original board back in the mid to late 90s before Perimeter was founded, because we, we basically followed the Cumberland example. Great. So Tracy. Yes. I know being an executive director for a CID is not always the easiest task. Mm -hmm. It's not like you can go out, because you have an amazing team, you really do. do. And you can't go out and just, it's not like you can go to KSU and say, hey, do you have a, a nurse or, a, or an accountant that I can hire to come in and do this role? Because that's not really what a CID is doing. Yeah. So when you're kind of looking at your overall staff and what the needs in order to best help the property owners succeed, which mm -hmm. is what you, you're, you're trying to do, you know, what are some of the characteristics of a perfect person to be part of your team? Um, so one, yes, I have an amazing team. And I am incredibly grateful for uh, everyone that is on staff at Town Center. And we have a small team. I think that that's a surprise to a lot of people that CIDs do not have large staffs. Right. Uh, we have a staff of five, including myself, that are full-time and we run two organizations and and we manage a budget of just under eight million dollars um, and have 496 parcels and 275 owners that we report to in town center and so it's complicated um, and so I think that the number one thing that you need is the ability to um, be flexible and you need those skills that I hate calling them soft skills because they're not at all their necessary skills. My, someone said to me, um, I have my master's in human organizational development, and they said, do you regret not you know, going into your field and getting that major? And I laughed, I said, I, I use my degree every day. <laughs> um, my dad's a mechanical engineer, retired, and, and he said, you're doing what? And I said, I, you know, nine years ago, I was in, a, in the consulting world working with nonprofits, but I was helping them think strategically and work relationally. And those are the skill sets that you need, I think, as, as team members of a CID and really any organization. We have more than 25 consultants that we work with who are engineers, and planners and surveyors and economic development experts and all of those people who are way smarter than me uh, personally. But they, what they bring is I, it's so much to the CID experience because we need all of those people in the commercial development community and beyond in order to be successful. So I think you need some, um, you need a little grace and a little grit um, patience and the ability to be a good communicator and and work with a variety of different people in a variety of settings. Great. And I would add, you know, talking about Tracy's team, they're dynamic thinkers. Mm -hmm. You know, I'm putting on my hat as AVP of Economic Development here yeah. at the university. We don't pay taxes. We're a state university. We're not the commercial property owners that are paying into the CID, but your staff ingratiates me into these conversations knowing what an integral part of the oh, community yeah. the university is. They do it with Wellstar and with CHOA. Mm -hmm. um, so to be able to think in that dynamic way, yes, our money is coming from commercial property owners, but the impact yeah. that that has goes far beyond just those that are paying that millage. We're one of the few CIDs, Midtown is another example, that has a large university inside of our boundary line. So all of 43,000 students at KSU are in town center. We are, they are not in the city of Kennesaw or Marietta. They may live and come in, but this is their, this is their place. And so the, the university and other public entities do not pay into the CID, but benefit from all of the work that we do. So there's a lot of collaboration that goes on with our master planning and road projects and a lighting project we're doing on Chastain Road right now. So we couldn't, we definitely couldn't do what we do in a vacuum. And my team's awesome. I love my team. <laughs> Yay, team. And, and, they are, I'll vouch for that. <laughs> and, and the business community really benefits from KSU Absolutely. Here as well because the workforce they create is vital to all of the business's success. Yeah. Um, we're, our, um, I'm gonna remind everybody to please, if you do have any questions uh, from the live stream, uh, please go ahead and put it in the live stream chat so we can make sure 
we are addressing your uh, questions as we uh, continue with this conversation. Uh, the next question, Tyler, I'm going to ask for you because you are uh, a researcher and a, a academic in the area of local government management and finance. Uh, so as, as you are more aware than anybody else sitting around this table is that there are a lot of levers that go into local government financing and there's a lot of actors that are involved in the process. Can you talk a little bit about how CIDs differ from say a chamber of commerce or a development authority or a special taxing district or the other entities that kind of play a part in the overall financial makeup of a, of, of a city or county? Absolutely. Uh, so more than anything, economic development is a team sport. Um, clearly, we're good at it here in Georgia. If you look at, at every metric and any, any indicator, we're, we're good at this game in Georgia. Um, but each of those actors takes on a different role and a different responsibility. You know, you know coming from the chamber world, uh, chambers are voluntary professional organizations. They're 501c6 nonprofits. They don't have governmental authority. They, they aren't paying for infrastructure. But chambers are really driving that, that desire to be a part of the community, to be a part of something bigger. Uh, development authorities are, are fundamentally public entities. They are creatures of the city and county governments where they exist. And they've got the, the legal tools and resources for uh, site selection for new companies that may be considering coming to, to Cobb County or to Cherokee or Paulding or Bartow County, wherever they may be. Uh, they can help with that site selection. They can help with, with incentive packages and work on tax, um, uh, uh, ad valorem tax incentives. Um, so they've got these legal tools that a lot of other organizations don't. We look to our CIDs. Um, obviously, these are voluntary taxing districts that are looking to take their communities and their regions to the next level. Uh, cities and counties, by and large, are going to have uh, economic development directors on staff. Uh, so they're going to have those resources to get into planning and zoning, to get into permitting, to make new businesses a reality, to, to really allow entrepreneurs and small business owners to focus on what they're doing, and even larger companies focus on what they're doing, not navigating the bureaucracy. So none of these actors can really exist in a silo. None of them is going to be effective in getting and growing business in our community by themselves. We've got to work together. We've, we've got to be having conversations about who can bring what to the table and how we can get it done quickly and efficiently. So if I'm a business owner uh, or I'm a property owner and I want to be part of a CID, is it like, is it based upon how many employees I have that I have to do with a certain assessment? Is it based upon my gross revenue? Like, how, how is the funding structure set up for CIDs where you can actually generate the revenue in order to make these improvements? anybody on the panel. <laughs> <laughs> I'll defer to Tracy How on it? membership. <laughs> well, it has to be 51% of commercial property owners in a geographic area representing 75% of the value. And you have to get that majority of the commercial property owners to agree to tax themselves. So that's the way that you set it up originally. That's, yep. Okay. And so then that money is collected on top of the property taxes. Right. And so it comes through the county um, or that taxing entity back to the CID. So it's a property tax ad valorem. Yes. That, and how does it get approved every year? Who's, mm -hmm. like, how do you set this number? Like we have what? these amazing board members <laughs> that are all commercial property owners. Um, and then there's a designee of the county or a city if there's a municipality. And those board members are the commercial representation of all of the property owners in that geographic area. And so they set the millage every year based right. on the millage rate that the county sets forth. So once the county proposes its millage, then the board determines what that millage can be. There is state enabling law that has a certain number uh, that is a max for millage. And then in Cobb County, we have a, a millage max of five mils. And I believe all of the CIDs are taxing at five mils all right three, now. All three. In Cobb. Yeah, in yeah, Cobb. Cumberland, or I mean, uh, perimeter is at four. Okay. And it, a lot of terms there that I know from years of teaching public finance make people's <laughs> eyes glaze over. Right. Um, talking about ad valorem, just fundamentally meaning on value. So it is the value of the property that you have that determines what that tax rate, and then Tracy used a, a key operative term there, millage rate. Mm -hmm. uh, millage rate is $1 of tax for every $1,000 of assessed value of that property. So it's something that can fluctuate year to year. It's not like a flat right. membership due that somebody's paying 
uh, or a percentage sales tax that you pay when you go to the store, you have to look at these formulas so that, that high school algebra comes into play there to understand what your needs are, what value you've got, where does that millage need to be? Mm -hmm. And we saw um, our millage rate go down uh, actually after the 2008 recession um, that went on for about three years. We saw millage rates probably drop. This was the perimeter CID is actually split between, Cum or between DeKalb and Fulton counties, and we now have three cities um, on top of those two counties. And so uh, but it went down probably about 10% and it's recovered since then. Yeah. But, um, you know, so when we're planning our budgets, um, we go through, we make the staff presents a plan for the next year and then only then and only then do we vote on the millage. Yeah. And we do not um, put projects in our pipeline that we do not have the funding for in terms of our percentage investment. Like I said, CIDs come in the beginning. We typically fund those first dollars in anywhere between five and 10% of these large infrastructure projects. But we also fund 100% of things like landscape maintenance and beautification. Our CID spends nearly a million dollars a year just on maintaining 22 miles of curb and gutter and roadway throughout town center. Um, and that's a, a dollar amount that the county isn't having to contribute in order to maintain those roadways. But we look out for our entire life cycle and we do a three year pro forma on the projects that are in the pipeline and how the funding is going to hit on an annual basis, provide that to our board in order to decide the millage. Yeah, if you, you know, you say, well, what's the visible manifestation uh, beyond traffic? If you go to every major improved interchange within the CID boundaries of almost every CID is that the landscaping mm -hmm. and the reason everything looks so nice is because the CID does that. I mean, for those of anybody who's in this audience who've driven through the 285-75 interchange for years, it was, I don't think they had cleaned it out in maybe 30 years. Yeah. I mean, it, there was trash, totally overgrown, the original landscaping. There are a lot of tall trees, and all we did was, and we, now GDOT is maintaining it, but they hadn't. We came in and we cleaned everything out, all of the underbrush, we limbed up all the trees, and now when you drive through there, it looks fantastic. But it didn't look that way for a long, long time. And so those are the kind of little wins, they're not little wins, they're big wins, the, the street lighting, the um, sidewalks. In perimeter, we've built seven, seven miles of sidewalks. Um, and street lighting, uh, the lighting at the intersections, mm -hmm. everything's upgraded so that it creates more of a sense of place um, that the county would not otherwise have money to do. You know, that really is a great segue into my next question, too. <coughs> I, I think that's a, that's a, that's a fantastic, and you've, you hit on that before, Bob, too. But I kind of want to do a deep dive on this. So we're, we heard about the value that y'all provide as a CIDs. Um, a, a reasonable person might ask the question, well, why doesn't the city or county just do that? I know you've never heard of that question before. <laughs> so how would you respond if someone were to, to say that to you? And Tracy, I want to start with you on this one. Okay. <laughs> um, the county, I, I can speak for Cobb, is that we have 800,000 residents that, is, that are projected to be over a million by 2040. And so the county has a lot of areas that it's responsible for. And the county is doing things in town center of contributing significantly to roadway projects, to helping um, do connectivity studies and a variety of other things. We can't do anything without the work of the county. They are our sponsor on a lot of our major ask to the Atlanta Regional Commission for federal funding and to the state and GDOT and GTIB for transportation dollars. Um, but there is, it's that above and beyond. It's the, I always say, if you, if you don't know what a CID does, go to the boundary line and look across the street. And it's what you don't see or you do see that is not being done outside of the boundary line. It's all of those extra things that we're able to provide that improve safety, improve traffic flow and mobility, as well as that walkability and sense of place. Yeah, I would say that we're able to notch it up 
a little more than what the county might otherwise choose to do because they're spreading their dollars across a, a wide, wide swath. And, you know, the county was absolutely a partner in making the Braves deal happen. I mean, they, you talk to the CDOT folks for about two mm -hmm. years, they focused almost all of their dollars or a huge chunk of it to doing the improvements that made things work for the stadium. So, um, you know, they've always been partners, but we are able to come in and I would say almost put the frame around the picture. You don't necessarily see the frame, but as Tracy was saying, is that you, you notice it when it's not there. Yeah. And that's when you look at somewhere else, you say, boy, this is nice. And, but that's, that's what we like to do. And I think it, it localizes it a lot more. You know, if you look at Cobb County and the three CIDs that are here, as Tracy said, this is a county of 800,000 quickly on its way to over a million. The county's limited in what it can do in such a wide area, whether you're looking at Kennesaw in the town center area, Cumberland in the Battery, get to East Cobb, get out toward Lost Mountain and West Cobb. It, it's a very dynamic community. Um, you look at the board that, that Bob sits on is in Fulton and DeKalb counties, two of the four largest counties in the state. This allows you to channel that energy in the roads in the past that you're driving every day, the restaurants that you're going to at lunch, uh, the, the roads you're having to take to get your kids to school. So, you know, I don't look to, to my city councilman or my, my county commissioner to know exactly what challenges I face getting from here to, to Town Park across the other side of 75. Having a, a CID that's more localized and able to channel those energies into the day-to-day -day opportunities that exist really adds a lot of value that you wouldn't necessarily see if you were looking countywide in Fulton, DeKalb, Cobb, or so many others in the metro Atlanta area. Yeah, I'll put my old community development hat on for a second. <laughs> it, you know, well, you have to tell speaking, us what your what your old job speaking, was. <laughs> speaking um, for the, uh, a city or county, they can't provide preferential treatment to any one area. If they're going to do something really nice for one area, they have to do something really nice for all areas. Right. So if CIDs really step in and help make that elevation where you can really set your area apart um, while not impacting kind of the, the fairness factor that governments must be concerned about in what they do on a day-to-day -day basis. So, you know, we're, we are talking about very urban areas in the state right now. Um, do you think this model is applicable to um, a smaller city in a non-urban area of the state? And how, how do you think that would function a little bit? I think, um, oh, go ahead. Whomever would like to talk. Well, no, I'm just saying, <laughs> I think it depends upon the, you, you know, you can only, um, you can only do as much as you can raise revenue. Yeah. And um, smaller cities, the, the business improvement district and downtown, you know, th there have been, those have been around a long time. And so, um, but when you, when you look at a jurisdiction, we, we see this even with some of the smaller CIDs in Metro, is that their budgets may be seven hundred thousand dollars a year. Perimeters eight million, Cumberland's eight million, I mean town centers eight million. Those are big numbers. Downtown and midtown's budgets are even higher. But you go out to some of the outlying districts and they're smaller, so you have to be more realistic about the projects you can you can put together. So um, you know the question is can you have as big an impact? You, it, but if you have you have a specific target that they want to do. It's like right, South Forsyth has created a CID um, in the in the Deer, and it's the commercial properties are all spread apart. They have to be connected too. You can't just have disparate parcels connecting. And so, if that commercial district is not tight, relatively tight, it's going to be very hard to set it up. And like Gateway Marietta is the third CID in Cobb. And while it's in the city of Marietta boundary, it's it's much smaller, and they have a strong focus on safety right. and bringing in flock cameras and things to improve that Franklin Gateway corridor. Um, and they do very specific projects around beautification and safety that have transformed that corridor. Um, so I think that if you have the contiguous property owners who are willing to come together and they're able to leverage it in a very finite way that those smaller communities can make an impact. And I think CIDs, unlike some of the other actors that we talked about earlier, if you look at development authorities, their roles and their functions are pretty consistent from development authority to development authority. Same with chambers of commerce. The CIDs, I think if you look at all 30 plus of them across Georgia, 
they're all very much directed toward the needs and desires of the property owners mm -hmm. within their boundaries. You know, Marietta being the perfect example, the priorities there are going to differ than what you see in Cumberland Perimeter, Town Center, or any of the others. So I think there's a unique ability for the CIDs to really define themselves. With that in mind, I think taking it to other communities in Georgia is, is very plausible. You know, the challenges that you face in Savannah, Albany, Macon, Columbus, Valdosta, they're going to be very different than what we face in metro Atlanta communities. But if the property owners in that area have that share goal, that share oh. objective, redevelopment of, of a fading mall, um, safety that you have in a particular corridor, uh, pedestrian friendly areas, parks and recreation trails, whatever the objectives of those property owners may be, the CID model is so adaptable that, yeah, I think they can take that and apply it in other parts of the state. Great. So, Bob, you sit on the board for two CIDs. And um, so you, you've experienced some of the major issues that are impacting the governance of those organizations. How do you see CIDs evolving over the next decade? Well, it's interesting. Um, I've been thinking some about that question because when the all well when Cumberland and Perimeter were formed when downtown and Midtown were formed um, the primary board members were all active developers of various properties so they had a specific agenda they were pushing for improvements that would help benefit properties that they are um, delivering what we're seeing now at, at least on the two boards that I serve is that you're moving as the properties are established. You have large tax, um, I mean, tax-paying entities, and so instead of having the developer on board, you now have asset managers, who are part of, um, who report to an institutional owner, and their perspective. I'm not attacking asset managers because <laughs> we actually it's manage different. properties. It's a different perspective. They generally are looking more, um, less, uh, less, you have to bring them along to see the vision more because they're more focused on um, n reducing operating costs on their particular property. And so I see that as kind of the challenge for CIDs going forward. But when you have folks like Tracy, Kim Menifee down at Cumberland, these are the executive directors. Um, Anne, Anne Hanlon over at Perimeter. <laughs> and uh, Jim Durrett at Bucket. The, in, the, in those cases, I think your executive directors take a stronger role and because they've got to bring along these new people who weren't there when, you know, in the early days. Does that, that answer it Absolutely. pretty well? <laughs> yeah. 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 So, so Tracy, mm -hmm. you know, you've really been, done a, a phenomenal job at Town Center. And a lot of the reason why you've done so well is the innovation that you've brought into even the concept of the CIDs. Mm -hmm. You know, one of the things that you have done is, uh, which I thought was, was, was brilliant, was to not just focus on the CID and the taxing entity of the CID, but creating an additional 501c3 model that you can then use to help with other aspects of community building can you talk a little bit about that and the relationship between the Town Center Alliance yeah. and the Town Center CID and how they work mm -hmm. together and how they support one another? Absolutely. Thank you for that. Um, so, like I said earlier, my background uh, in organizational development and uh, previous career in nonprofit and then consulting work. And so, I had a lot of experience in nonprofits and raising dollars and working in communities to get projects done. And so as CIDs have evolved over the 35 years in Georgia and the communities have changed, so have the funding needs. And so you have commercial property owners that are contributing a finite dollar amount based on the millage rate, but that's the only way a CID can generate revenue. And so looking at the flip side of that, a CID can only invest in things inside their geographical boundary line. So if you have a roadway that the CID is on the east side but not on the west side, the CID can't maintain the rest, west side of that roadway, although everyone thinks that that full roadway is inside the CID. And so uh, the tool of the alliance is simply another way to forward the mission and the goals of the town center community. 
for us, we brought in the CID um, originally and 25 years ago, and then six years ago, we created the Town Center Community Alliance. And it started as a, a strategic way for us to seek funding from other revenue sources, so philanthropically through sponsorships, events like our Noonday Shanty 510K, which is coming up <laughs> next month, um, but also to allow us to invest dollars from in places that are very much in line with the projects and priorities of the CID, but may not be right in our boundary line. For example, we can be involved in the four miles of trail that's being constructed from the city of Woodstock down to our Noonday Creek Trail at our boundary line. Um, but the CID could not put funds into that because it's outside of our boundary line. But because of the alliance, we have the ability to partner in other ways. And what it's done for us is help create that sense of community. CIDs mm -hmm. still have the basis of their budgets in infrastructure because those are our big projects. South Bear, Barrett Reliever Phase 3 is under construction for us right now. That's a $43.5 million project. And so it is, you know, big numbers, big projects, long term gain. But what we also have are our placemaking projects. We were the first CID to have bike share, and we uh, established it five years ago. It had the highest ridership of any bike share in the company's fleet in the entire United States. And then we partnered with Cumberland, with City of Smyrna, with KSU, and other entities to connect those programs. And we're working on a model with them collectively to create a regional bike share program that connects over 22 miles of trail all the way from City of Woodstock, City of Kennesaw, and Ackworth down through uh, KSU and Town Center to the Kennesaw Mountain Battlefield to the trails in City of Smyrna and Cumberland CID to the Silver Comet and eventually the Beltline. So when you think about the, the ability to do more with not a lot of additional resources, the, the Alliance's budget is less than 10% of the overall budget of the CID. But the impact we're able to have on those dollars is incredibly significant. And it gives community uh, residents, students, tenants who feel that this is their home and their business has been here for 25 years, they get to be a member and be engaged in a different kind of way. So for us, it's been a huge win-win um, and a very successful endeavor. And Jennifer Hogan on our team continues to lead the, the work of the CID uh, and the Alliance in our community. So Tyler, if I'm a student at KSU or Georgia State or Morehouse, what was the best way for me to get plugged in with the CID and see how I can get involved? Well, I, you know, I think keeping in mind open beyond your field of study. Um, as you hear in these projects, this is not limited to political science. This is not limited to public administration. Um, I know our College of the Arts students had done some work with the Town Center CID in the Master Craftsman program. Um, thinking about the built environment, if you look at, at architecture programs or construction management programs, just think holistically about where you fit in to community. And I think thinking about yourself as part of a, a bigger effort, a, a more dynamic, a more complex effort, uh, and thinking about how you can further your own education in that is an opportunity. Um, if you're you know, working on a, a degree in public administration, take a class in historic preservation because inevitably you're going to face those kind of challenges. You may not be an expert on it, but you understand how those dots connect. You understand where those, those worlds are colliding and how it results in, as Tracy was talking about, that broader idea of community. It doesn't end at a jurisdictional boundary. It doesn't end at some, some road that you cross. Community is dynamic. Community is complex. Understand where you and your studies and your passion and your enthusiasm fits into that. I study public budget and finance. It is not the most thrilling thing in the world. I am the first to admit it. But I like to be able to play a role in understanding where it fits into the work that Tracy and her team are able to do, that Bob and, and the teams that he's got at Cumberland and at uh, Perimeter are able to do. Understanding where you fit and being able to work collaboratively and constructively with those that know more than you do. I think that's really the crux of it. So I got a great question from, from the chat about your favorite project that you've worked on. I'm going to ask it, obviously, for, for, for Bob and Tracy, what is your favorite project? For Tyler, I'm going to change that a little bit. And what do you think is 
what do you, uh, some of the powers of the CID that would be innovative, that would be very, that kind of uh, innovative and exciting that you think is different? So, Bob, we'll start with you on your, your absolute hands down favorite project you have worked on as a member of two CIDs. And I don't mean to put you on the spot and have you pick between the two of them, but. Well, no, I'll, I'll <laughs> um, I have a favorite project and then I have a most impactful project. Uh, actually, okay, it's so. <laughs> So the most impactful project, which is still being done, is the 285-400 um, interchange. Mm -hmm. We started um, with, in 1992 when I was um, working at Ravinia uh, at Perimeter off Ashford Dunwoody. I, I was able to get in touch with the director, or the, I guess it's the commissioner of GDOT, and was explaining to him that we had problems with traffic flow on 285 and he told me that that was and we needed work on our interchanges and he told me that the answer to that was to leave things the way they were because if we kept the traffic on the surface streets it would allow the traffic to flow better on the interstate <laughs> and that's that's I mean we, we have come a long way since then but we began when the when our uh, perimeter CID uh, was formed one of our goals we had interim goals and we had big goals but the big goal was to rebuild all of our interchanges and we've done that except for 485 and our CID contributed 10 million dollars towards the design work on wow. 700 million dollar project but still we put skin in the game and they gave us a seat at the table um, with with GDOT so that's the most impactful ironically I talked about the other one before because I love landscaping and I hate, hate it when you drive through areas and it just looks like, um, you know, it looks like no one's t taking care of it. And that was the 75, uh, 285 <laughs> interchange. And so Barry Teague and I on the, on the uh, Cumberland board were, have been pounding on poor Kaitha. Uh, <laughs> and, and she, and this took four years to get that done. That's gorgeous. Um, and all it is is just, clean up your landscaping and then there's hardly any maintenance to do on it at all but just clean it up because when people drive through it looks like these people care about their area mm -hmm. and so that's those are my two and I know the whole region is um, a little frustrated with the construction right now but when <laughs> it's done the entire be region amazing. will be so thankful for that early investment in that interchange improvement because it's going to really impact the region and what you did. So it, it'll, it'll be that transformational. Well, the elements that are open now really make a difference. If you're going north on 400 coming from this area and you get off on the CD lane before Roswell Road, it's it's like night and day. It's yeah. the same thing that happened when we put up the toll lanes here along 75. Yeah. It's transformational. Yeah. Tracy? The toll lanes were going to be mine. So <laughs> I need to use my thunder. No. So the CID actually didn't have any investment in the toll lanes. But what we did do is reconnect Big Shanty. So that road was originally bifurcated when 75 came through years ago. And so the CID knew that that roadway had to be reconnected. And what sprung out of that originally, the plan, was that it was going to be a northbound reliever for Barrett Parkway. But at the time, KSU was maybe around 1,300 students. What it didn't realize that it was also going to become a very important southbound reliever for mm. Chastain Road. And then it also created the opportunity for a full interchange for the Northwest Corridor Managed Lanes Project. And that has been a significant project to not only get traffic moving through, but getting the general purpose lanes yep. moving faster. It has reduced uh, rush hour, both AM and PM significantly. I think by an entire hour on both end, if I'm correct at those numbers. Um, so it's really something that it's, it's a project that we were involved in, but it's really all of the things that we had prior to it, like Big Shanty, that are really important. And I mentioned South Barrett three, but I think the project that I smile about the most is Aviation Park. So the Noonday Creek Trail was a seven mile, mile trail that runs east to west from Bells Ferry Road to Kennesaw Mountain National Battlefield. And that trail was completed in 2014, 
but it didn't have any amenities. And so it started as a conversation at DOT with Parks and Rec, the DOT um, director at the time, and the head of the McCollum International Airport saying, how do we get restrooms along the trail? And we knew we had three acres at the end of the runway that was Cobb County owned, that the CID and then the Alliance could partner with to create originally restrooms. But what sprung from that was this incredibly creative project that has restrooms as a, a, a replica of the control tower that is at McCollum Field, as well as an entire acre of green space where we <coughs> do yoga in the park. REI comes and does bike riding classes in our parking mm. lot. We have a STEM themed playground and the pavilion looks like the wings of a plane. It is booked every weekend for birthday parties and kids mm. events and things that you wouldn't anticipate inside of a CID, but it's become a real heart and soul, I think, of the work that we do. And we're getting ready to put the traveling fence gallery back up um, that goes all around Cobb County this week um, in Aviation Park. So that's, it's really fun. Tell opportunities. I would say always push the limits. You know, when we think about CIDs, when they came into existence back in 1988, the, the purpose was clearly defined. State law empowered Cumberland in a way that was very narrowly understood, and, and they achieved many of those goals and continue to do so to this day. Town Center pushed the limit by creating a nonprofit to go along with it. That I can't imagine in the General Assembly in 1988 was even on their radar, but Town Center pushed the limit, and now Cumberland's following suit. Right. Um, I think you, you can also think big, you know, looking to Cumberland. I believe the CID was the driving force behind adding the exit to Acres Mill from the express lanes. Um, that's a federal interstate highway, and a community improvement district was able to have that kind of impact. That was one of our board members who said, time out. We did the same thing at Perimeter mm -hmm. because they were, the design of the interchange was not going to allow uh, and direct access at Ashford Dunwoody, which has 60,000 cars a day. Mm -hmm go through that interchange. <laughs> Sounds like Barrett Parkway. <laughs> yeah, no, and so, you know, but we had a voice at the table and we said, your engineers need to look at this. And it was like the light bulb went on. Yeah. And if I was talking to others around the state, other communities that were looking at CIDs, I would say, don't feel like you need to model yourself off Tracy or, or model yourself no, off Bob. Don't. You've got your own unique community right. needs. You know your community better than anyone else. Think big about what you can do to positively affect change in your community. Right. So we are almost out of time, so I'm going to ask one more group question uh, for all of you to answer. Um, so, you know, we've all talked about CIDs and the ecosystem that we're in as it relates to uh, the functions and the future of CIDs. We've had, talked on that a lot. But where do you see as the growth areas for CIDs moving forward? What kind of additional areas do you think CIDs could fill in the gap? And Tom, let me start with you. Sure, I think we're going to continue to grow. Uh, as we've said several times, if you look at the CID ecosystem in Georgia, it is largely a Metro Atlanta centric kind of model. I think if we look at the growth that we see throughout Georgia, there are new and unique opportunities that are going to come up. Uh, if we go down to the coast in Bryan County and what's going to be coming from the Hyundai Kia plant down there, that is going to bring thousands of jobs directly and tens of thousands of jobs indirectly. How do you define a sense of place in what to date has been a largely rural part of the state? There's got to be a sense of community that comes out of it. There are going to be new and unique challenges that the Bryan, Bullock, Chatham, Effingham County area faces. How do they address those? And CIDs, if you can get your business owners to really make that investment, make that commitment to building that community, in their case, from the ground up, then I think it can be a huge opportunity in those areas where we see large growth outside of Metro Atlanta. I think for some of the older CIDs, the more mature CIDs, <laughs> such as Cumberland Perimeter Town Center, there's a strong focus on redevelopment. There is not any remaining greenfield space. And so while CIDs are not commercial development entities nor economic development entities that can give incentives and, and, and abatements and that sort of thing, we can certainly partner with the entities that can and we know our community better than anyone else. And so the work around looking at 
um, different roadways and how it impacts potential redevelopment in an area is going to be critical, in my opinion, for the, the next several decades. I think that also for us, we're looking at smart technology. We are not designing a roadway that is not a complete street that includes vehicular, transit, right. uh, pedestrian, and bike paths that are separated from the roadway because you really don't want to get in a bike lane on a 45 mile an hour road that people drive 60 on. <laughs> and so then we're looking at all of those developments, but more importantly, the technology around it. So we are partnering with the Atlanta Regional Commission on electrification study based off of the recommendations that have come out of the state and also uh, USDOT, but we're looking at different modalities. We're not looking at companies and how it's priced. We're letting all of them figure that out. But we're trying to figure out, okay, this is the technology that's on the ground now. What's going to be needed in five, 10 years? And that's a hard question to answer mm -hmm. because we don't know what's coming. But we don't want to invest in infrastructure today that's gonna be outdated by the time we get it completed. So that along with looking at freight and logistics, we have 75 corridor coming through our CIDs, which is the busiest freight corridor in the state of Georgia. With the widening of the port in Savannah, it's even more critical. And so it's not only how do you get truck traffic through our districts, but how do you get all that curb traffic, all of our Uber Eats and Amazon deliveries and the things that we just get on a regular basis to our doorstep more quickly and effectively, while at the same time creating that sense of place and walkability and, and community for all of the residents that are now living in these commercial districts. I think it depends on where the CID is and what they've done historically at the perimeter. Um, we're in the middle of trying to com catch up in terms of our trail network system to where Cumberland is, where a lot of the other CIDs are. So we're doing that. Um, we have commissioned arts program for the, we have four MARTA stations in the perimeter market, which is somewhat unique. And so making those spaces, which you know have kind of a Soviet industrial look to them, um, softening those and making them look better. I hope nobody is <laughs> on the MARTA board here. Um, but uh, it's so those are the, f that's the center of focus there once we get the interchange done. And then the last thing is intra-market connectivity. When you don't have enough uh, uh, road space for you know you you try to create a circular shuttle but if your road network is shut down because of traffic the circulator is just another vehicle on the road going the same speed and so at perimeter we are looking at an above ground circulator um, and uh, and then here at um, at Cumberland you, you probably read about this is that we are actually studying the um, autonomous vehicle um, technology to accompany our uh, loop, uh, which is called the Cumberland Sweep, um, that's been announced. And so uh, we're working right now with CDOT and CDOT being Cobb uh, Department of Transportation and Georgia DOT to um, go through all the engineering to fund that work along with federal money and state money. So it's, you know, everyone is different. There's soft stuff to continue to improve the markets, but we're kind of coming in and filling in the, filling in the gaps of things that hadn't been done there. That is fantastic. Tracy, Bob, Tyler, this was an amazing conversation. It is an incredible to have a board member, an executive director, and a researcher talking about such relevant topics that impact our community and how it, this all fits together. So thank you for your time today. Thank you for joining us. Um, and as we look forward, uh, we will have one more Campus to Community Forum for the remainder of the 2022 to 2023 academic year. That will be the Small Business Development in Metro Atlanta. That'll be on Tuesday, April 25th at 10 o'clock a.m. So we look forward to you joining us and seeing us for that one final conversation about how KSU is positively impacting our community. So thank you so much. Have a great day and we'll see you soon.